Hi, so I'll I'll just get started, um, but we'll give it an extra minute or two for people to join. So for those of you who are just joining us, um, I'm Paddy Mark. I'm professor of nephrology at the uh, University of Glasgow, and I work as a nephrologist here in Glasgow. Um, and I'm delighted to be uh, to be joined by an esteemed faculty of you know, co co moderators or co panelists, and uh, then we'll have an exciting talk. I said, but welcome to this ERA, European Renal Association, Eureka M, that's the European Renal and Cardiovascular Medicine Working Group e-seminar on cholesterol lowering. So um, I'd like to introduce my co-panelists. I'll start with uh, Lucia. And Lucia, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lucia Del Vecchio. I'm a nephrologist. I've been working for more than 20 years in Lecco, and I recently moved uh, to Como on the other side of the lake. And uh, from the scientific point of view, I've been involved for many years in trying to understand uh, why CKD patients are exposed to a such high cardiovascular uh, burden. Thanks, Lucia. I'm already jealous living in an industrial grey, miserable city such as Glasgow that you're in Como. Uh, Robert, I will, um, would you, can you introduce yourself quickly from Slovenia? Hello to everybody. My name is Robert Eckert. I'm professor of internal medicine and nephrology at University Medical Center in Maribor, Slovenia. So my, uh, I'm also working more than 20 years in the field of medicine. My main uh, field is, uh, our cardiovas is cardiovascular disease in CKD patients. And I really i am glad to, uh, that I'm here with you. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. And I think we're all very excited to uh, introduce our, uh, our uh, like plenary lecturer. So uh, Charlie Farrow is Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine at the University of Birmingham, and he works as a consultant nephrologist in Birmingham as well. And uh, Charlie's been one of my sort of heroes as I was growing up and as a nephrologist interested in cardiovascular disease, and he's led a number of exciting uh, clin randomized clinical trials, including sp with spironolactone and with phosphate lowering to try and improve cardiovascular outcomes. And he's led a, a number of initiatives um, on in, in, in the field of cardiovascular medicine, crossing valvular disease, early chronic kidney disease, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm delighted that today he's, um, he's taken some time to uh, deliver a plenary lecture on uh, cholesterol lowering and dialysis, which I think is one of those topics which remains controversial and is definitely worth revisiting with some new developments. So Charlie, over to you. Thank you, Paddy. That was a really lovely introduction. I was, must admit, I was a bit apprehensive um, when I saw that you were chairing, but, but thank you very much. Um, I'm now trying to share my screen. You cannot share a screen. Okay. I'll share a screen now. There we go. Thanks. So I've been tasked with talking about revisiting cholesterol lowering in CKD and dialysis, and what have the new agents got to offer, which um, is much more than a half an hour's subject. So I think I'm gonna focus it as much as I can to the drugs that are actually currently available rather than the ones that are in development. We've got no disclosures to declare. And we're gonna start with the basics. I think it's important that we, we all get ourselves a level playing field. So we're gonna talk about LDL cholesterol. And actually throughout this talk, when actually people talk about cholesterol, we really are talking about low density lipoprotein cholesterol. In the, we're going to start off in the general population. So we've known since the late 60s, and this is an example from the Framingham study, that serum cholesterol lipoproteins increase the risk of coronary heart disease. And they do that when you have large studies like the Framingham database, for example. You can do that in excluding people with diabetes, people who are smokers, people with other kinds of risk factors. And there's a clear linear relationship between high cholesterol, high LDL cholesterol, and the risk of getting cardiovascular disease. So this is in the late 60s, I said this paper is in 1971. But for those 25 years before the publication of the 4S study, it was really quite controversial whether lowering cholesterol, lowering LDL cholesterol was the right thing to do. So when in 1994, and I still remember the publication of this study very, very well, 
The Scandinavians in the statin survival study showed that in patients who already had a cardiovascular event treated with simvastatin, there was a marked reduction in cardiovascular events. And that, I think, was first the, the first experimental proof that cholesterol lowering was good in the general population. This was quickly followed by the WASCOP study done in the place where Paddy lives, um, the West of Scotland coronary prevention study, which in those days we'd call a, sec a primary prevention study. And these were effectively very high risk Glaswegian men who all smoke, all drank heavily and all uh, did very little exercise or I stereotype, but they were actually probably nowadays we'd call them secondary prevention and extremely high risk patients. And this also confirmed the same finding that lowering cholesterol, lowering LDL cholesterol, improved cardiovascular outcomes in high-risk population. So this is for the first time, I, I think the Secretariat tell me, we're gonna make this a bit more interactive um, to try to get audience participation. And we're gonna start, we're gonna have some questions scattered throughout. They're not hard questions, but it's something that will hopefully give me something to talk about. So question one, is treatment with statins effective in reducing cardiovascular risk in the general population? And you're gonna be shown five options. Yes, definitely. Yes, probably. Don't know, we need more studies. No, probably, or no, definitely. And I'd ask you to start voting now. I think because of the time constraints, I'm only gonna give about 15, 20 seconds for people to vote. So as I said, it's, it's, it's not a real, it's not a test. I just want to gauge people's opinions as we go along. So I think that's probably good 15, 20 seconds. So we can see the answers to that. Oh, so 71% said yes, definitely. 26% are still remain a bit skeptical. Yes, probably. And 3% say don't know. Okay, well, that's interesting. I thought it was going to be 100% yes, definitely. Uh, and I say that because we've got a huge amount of evidence. So if we look at what the cl cholesterol trial collaboration, the um, trialist collaboration have found, um, and they've made big inroads into understanding of treatment of um, cardiovascular disease by lowering cholesterol. In 2012, they published this meta-analysis where they had 27 trials of statins against controls or lower versus higher dose statins, which came to a massive total of 175,000 patients. And they found that statin therapy reduces a five-year risk of major cardiovascular events in patients with less than a 10% risk of having a cardiovascular event in a subsequent year. That's pretty conclusive, I think. And it was, and they even found that five, those are a risk of 5%. And of course, the relative risk reduction is relatively the same across risks, but actually the absolute reduction absolute risk reduction is much higher with um, the higher the risk. And that goes for major coronary events, strokes, coronary vascularization, and major vascular events. The interesting thing is that they found that for every one millimole reduction in LDL cholesterol, there was a consistent reduction in cardiovascular events. And also very importantly, they didn't identify a lower limit of cholesterol. So maybe in, in after I finished talking on the questions, maybe the people that said, the 3% that said that um, we need more studies. Maybe they can share with us why, because um, I said to me, this is already conclusively proven. But I'm happy to be, to be proven wrong. All right, so when I go around talking about dialysis in Birmingham, I don't like to show many statistics, but I just show this picture of, of our patients having their own bicycle racks to cycle in for their dialysis, which I think is probably unique in the world. Um, I'm joking, none of my patients cycle. I think there's a nurse that part of there. So atheroma in patients with chronic kidney disease and on dialysis. So it didn't take long from the initiation of long-term dialysis in about 1960 in Seattle by Belding Scribner and his team to find that patients on dialysis were getting very accelerated rates of atheroma, um, including myocardial infarction and heart attacks. I think anybody that talks about cardiovascular disease will often show this slide panel on your left by Rob Foley, which showed that if you're on a dialysis patient aged about 30, your chances of having a, here in the red, your chances of having a cardiovascular 
event that resulted in mortality in the subsequent year, remember this is a logarithmic scale, is somewhere between 10, 100, between 100 and 1,000 times higher than somebody in the general population. Or put another way, the, the risk of a 30-year-old 30, 30 on dialysis of having a cardiovascular death in the subsequent year is the same as somebody aged over 85 in the general population. Now, these numbers vary a bit, but the point remains that patients on dialysis are extremely high risk. Moving on to 2004, and Alan Goh, using the Kaiser Permanente database from Northern California, showed very much similar findings in those with early, earlier chronic kidney disease, with the risk becoming apparent as soon as the EGFR dropped below 60, um, as shown here in the second panel, but actually really becoming seriously elevated when the GFR drops below 45 and then increases logarithmically. So we know the cardiovascular risk is increased in dialysis patients and it's increased in early CKD relative to GFR. Oops, sorry, my screen is frozen. Oh, I don't know what to say. There you go. No, it's coming. Sorry. We had the wheel of death spinning around. It's just come back. Um, and we also know now, and increasingly, we, our knowledge is increasingly extending, that the atherogenic lipid profile in CKD and dialysis patients is very much worse than in the general population. And it's a long, it's a long list of what goes wrong. And I'd encourage you perhaps to read our Eurocam publication in Nature Reviews and Nephrology in 2018. Um, and essentially, the, the main differences uh, between CKD and dialysis patients and the general population is that they have raised triglycerides, they have a lower high density lipoprotein cholesterol, they have a lower overall LDL cholesterol, but these LDL cholesterols tend to be smaller and therefore probably more atherogenic. They can get through the endothelium there easier. And they tend to be more post translationally modified with more oxidation and more carbamylation. Again, making them more atherogenic. There are two other changes that we'll talk about perhaps a bit more length later on, that they have higher pro-protein converted subtacillin um, relative to LDL cholesterol, and they have higher lipoprotein A's. So coming to the second question, is treatment with statins effective in reducing cardiovascular risk in patients with chronic kidney disease not on dialysis? Yes, definitely. Yes, probably. Don't know more studies needed, no probably or no definitely. And if you'd like to start voting now. Okay, that's probably 15, 20 seconds. Can we see what the results are? Okay, so slightly different. So in CKD, about half, just over half say yes, definitely. 32, yes, probably. Nobody thinks we need more studies. And again, it's a significant proportion, 9% and 3%, showing no probably or no definitely. Again, I'm surprised by that, but maybe our, pan our panelists and chairman can comment on that later with me and see if they are surprised as well. So we'll close that and ask the next question, which is exactly the same question by patients on dialysis. So is treatment with statins effective in reducing cardiovascular risk in patients on dialysis? Yes, definitely. Yes, probably. Don't know more studies needed. No, probably or no, definitely. And can you vote now? I'm trying to lead the panelist expressions and I'm not sure I can see if they're surprised or not. Right, that's a good 15, 20 seconds. So let's have a look at what people say to this one. Surely we're good. We're, 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 we've been asked by our ERA uh, team supporting us. Uh, just gives a little bit more time for our uh, questions. Okay. So, because they're great questions. I'm not going to tell you what I said until the end for each question. I'm, I'll maybe, maybe I just hit the wrong button. Okay. So this is clearly a don't know because a quarter say yes, definitely. Another quarter, yes, probably. But a third say no, probably. And 
15 no definitely so this is more in line with what i expected because I, I don't think we really perhaps know the answer to this one particularly so again we turn to the clinical trial list collaboration the cholesterol clinical trial list collaboration and in 2016 i think um paddy mark was one of the main authors in this having reanalyzed the aurora study um, 28 trials of statins versus control in 183,419 patients with chronic kidney disease. That, that's an amazing number of patients to recruit into a systematic review and meta-analysis. And they found that the relative reductions in major vascular events observed as statin-based treatment became smaller as eGFR declined. So that's it. The, the benefit that people patients got from cholesterol lowering was less. And it also became evident that the, the amount of cholesterol lowering per dose of statin was also less. And actually, there was very little, if any, evidence of benefit on dialysis patients. So they recommend, and I think that's what conventional wisdom at present is, and it's what my opinion is as well. And again, I'm, I quite like to sort of see if we can, that can be challenged in the discussion later, is that in patients with chronic kidney disease, statin-based regimens should be chosen to maximize the absolute reduction in LDL cholesterol to achieve the largest treatment benefits. And again, in this study, I don't think they found any benefit, any lower limit of LDL cholesterol lowering in CKD. So these kind of studies are what's informed the K-DIGO guidelines, which are probably now getting a bit old in 2013. Um, and that is in patients with CKD and transplant. It's a two patients with CKD stages one to five, not on dialysis, aged 50 or more with a statin or statin acetamide combination, particularly in light of the SHARP trial. And to treat younger patients, 18 to 49, if high risk, and by that they mean with known ischemic heart disease, diabetes mellitus, previous ischemic stroke, and an estimated 10-year risk of non-fatal myocardial infarction or cardiovascular death more than 10%, using whatever uh, risk or use, most people using framing and base ones. And to treat all adult kidney transplant recipients based on the ALERT trial or an extension of the ALERT trial, so evidence from one single study. Okay, so if that's what the K-DIGO guidelines say, and we've we've had um, a discussion and question and answer session about what we do. Question four, I routinely treat patients with CKD not on dialysis with statins. I thought I was gonna anticipate the answer to this, but with the answer we've had so far, I'm not so sure I'm gonna be right. So one for true and two for false. If you'd like to vote now. I'm going to try and give this one a good 30 seconds or, or 45 if I can. So how many happy birthdays do I have to sing? I know it's two to wash my hands, but. Okay. Ooh. So two thirds, so 70% routinely treat their patients not on dialysis with a statin and 31% don't. Okay, interesting. We can bring that for discussion at, at the end. Oops, go on to question five. So this is the same question, but this time on dialysis. I routinely do not treat patients on dialysis with statins regardless of the clinical situation. So one for true, two for false. Please vote now. Okay. Ooh, so 50-50 split. Oh, this is fascinating. Again, I thought everybody blindly followed what Kay Daigo said. Um, gosh, I, I'm really shocked by this. Okay, so this is more for discussion at the end, I think. And for the last question, my cardiology colleagues insist on treating my diastasis patients with evidence of coronary atheroma. Vote one for true or two for false. You can vote now. Gosh, I thought I'd chosen six non-controversial questions that were 
just to test the system rather than provoke this particularly strong opinionated discussion. But I think this is what we're going to get, hopefully. Okay, so the cardiologists are much more enthusiastic about using statins than we are, which is, again, is very much my experience. And 10% of cardiologists don't recommend using statins in dialysis patients. Okay, fascinating. Okay, so why wouldn't statins work in dialysis patients? Um, well, there's a potential number of reasons. And so in the general population, there's a very much a direct correlation between LDL cholesterol and coronary heart disease. So for every one milli, millimole per liter increase in LDL cholesterol, it's a 40% increase in cardiovascular risk. In dialysis patients, no such correlation exists really. It's either completely flat line or there's an inverse correlation. So the higher the cholesterol, the lower the risk of a cardiovascular event. This has been termed reverse epidemiology, reverse causality, or the risk factor paradox, depending on, on the um, author. There's also a very unique cardiovascular phenotype with chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease. So there's arteriosclerosis more often rather than atheroma. So this is a medial calcification fibrotic process rather than co intimal cholesterol plaque that atheroma is. There's the uremic cardiomyopathy, which Professor Mark and myself have both spent a large part of our career st studying, which is underpinned by myocardial fibrosis, left ventricular initially diastolic dysfunction and subsequently systolic dysfunction as well as an increase in LV mass. And of course, this leads to heart failure and sudden cardiac death, probably from arrhythmogenic causes. And these all become much more important than myocardial infarction, certainly in terms of numbers. And as we've already alluded to, there are perhaps different lipid abnormalities, of which the one we're going to focus on is lipoprotein A. Sorry, this is my, my new bike. I couldn't resist sharing a picture of that, which I can't bring to work because it'll last five minutes before it's stolen. So statin secrets. So something that's little known about statins, which most people, perhaps not the audience today, but certainly most people think are wonder drugs and help. Um, so they generally re reduce LDL cholesterol, but they increase PCSK9 concentrations as well. And we'll talk why that might be important in a few minutes. The same with LPA, they, as in the study on the right side of your panel, even though they have significant lowering impact on LDL cholesterol, the also increased LP little a. So let's talk about PCKS9, so proprotein converted subtacillin kexin type 9. So again, you can read more detail about this in our publication, Nature Reviews. But essentially, LDL cholesterol binds to an LDL receptor on the surface of the liver cells. They form a complex that's taken into the cell and internalized. The LDL cholesterol dissociative receptor is integrated into the cell. The receptor then goes back into the surface, ready to bind more LDL cholesterol and remove from the circulation. In the presence of PCKS9, the receptor is broken down and therefore cannot return to the surface and it cannot keep lowering LDL. So the amount of LDL concentration goes up. So what happens to PCKS9 in patients with CKD and end-stage kidney disease? Well, several, if not all, studies have shown that circulating concentrations of PCKS9 do not increase with worsening renal function. However, the PCKS9 LDL ratio increases with worsening kidney function. So effectively, there's more PCKS9 per LDL cholesterol as the lower the EGFR goes. There's now two licensed antibodies, evolucumab and alorumucumab, which are targeting the PCKS9 antibodies, and both have been tested in major trials. Evolucumab in the Fourier studies and alorumucumab in the Odyssey trials. They both lower LDL cholesterol by a phenomenal 60 to 70 percent and sustained over, over many months and years. And this is a drug that has to be administered only twice weekly by subcut injection. Both lower the risk of cardiovascular events. And remember, these are patients already on high dose statins or optimized, the most highly tolerated dose of statin, who are already at high risk. And they lower the risk by about 25, 15 to 20 percent. Um, over two and a half years, three years in this in the um, four-year study, which is a short time period, and it's likely as in the statin studies, most of them go on five years. The effects are very comparable to statins. 
So as usual, we, we haven't got direct evidence from CKD patients. We have to rely on sub-analyses of the big studies. But because these studies were huge with, with 50,000 at least patients between them, we can subdivide them into CKD stages three, four, two, and those who preserved kidney function. And in regards of kidney function, the LDL cholesterol lowering was the same at about 60%, which is very different to what we see with statins. And again, relying on the Fourier study, um, when you break down outcomes by GFR, evolucumab reduces them across the range of, of GFR studied compared to placebo. And if anything, although we've got to remember the numbers of those with very low kidney function were actually quite low, the effects seem to be greater um, the lower the GFR, or at least the difference between placebo and evolucumab seem to be greater at lower GFRs. So the opposite of what we find in statins that the effect seems to diminish as GFR goes down. We've now also got incliceran, which is a small interfering RNA double-stranded oligonucleotide. It inhibits the synthesis of PCKS9 inhibitor. And the huge advantage of this is that it only has to be admitted, administered by subcut injection every six months. The UK NHS or health service has just signed a deal with Novartis um, so that we can start giving this with even without outcome data, so patients are very high risk who have not tolerated statins. The cost is eye-watering. Um, we're not sure what deal has been struck, but we think rumors are it's about one and a half thousand pounds per dose. So that's nearly 2,000 euros per dose or 4,000 euros for a year's treatment. But obviously somebody's done the calculations and this is must think is cost effective. And glycerin is phenomenal at lowering LDL cholesterol, again, by about 60% from baseline and sustained. And these are from the Orion 10 and 11 studies. Um, there is a large outcome study ongoing, but this hasn't been reported yet. So going on to lipoprotein A. The lipoprotein A or LP little a is highly heterogenic and strongly associated with cardiovascular risk. Most of the circulating levels are actually genetically determined and the levels increase with declining renal function with diastasis patients having by far the highest concentrations observed. In patients with low LDL cholesterol, it is possible that most of what is measured is actually lipoprotein A. I'll show you why. Lipoprotein A is associated with atherosclerosis, it's intense, intensely atherogenic, and also with aortic valve calcification, two common factors seen in CKD patients. Whereas LDL here in the blue is an ApoB100 lipoprotein attached to it, there's a small ApoA attached to it, um, LPA, which makes it an LPA. And sometimes you get a very large ApoA protein attached. Actually, most of the um, analyses a laboratory analysis measuring LDA can't distinguish between LDA and LPA. And in fact, the neither can the calculations that we sometimes use. So most of the measured LDL cholesterol is actually real LDL plus LPA. And in chronic kidney disease, and especially in patients with dialysis, low measured LDL cholesterol and high LPA. And therefore, the lower the measured LDL cholesterol, proportionally there's more LPA around. And LPA, as I said, is not reduced by statins. In fact, it's increased further by statins. So there is a drug to interfere with this as well, called pelicarsin. It's actually got a lot, lot of other names, which you'll see here with lots of letters that I find unpronounceable. And it's a hepatocyte-directed antisense oligonucleotide targeting the MRIA, mRNA transcribed from the LPA gene, resulting in decreased APOA availability and therefore lower LPA levels. These drugs are phenomenal at, lose, at lowering LPA and they lower them by 70 to 80% in a dose dependent manner and the effects sustained over multiple weeks. I said evolucumab and alirucumab, PCSK9 inhibitors, both also lower lipoprotein A levels, A concentration circulating, unlike statins. There are trials ongoing with pelicarsins but there are implications for renal patients. And that's because renal patients are not going to be included in these studies. So if you have an EGFR of less than 60, you can't get onto the study. If you have an albumin creatinine ratio of greater than 100 milligrams per gram, you're excluded. And of course, if these patients are excluded, we can't have subgroup analysis of CKD patients. 
even worse in the upcoming uh, hard endpoint study horizon, the same patients with significant kidney disease are going to be excluded. It's not clear from the website what significant kidney disease means, but I suspect it'll be very similar to the um, dose finding studies. So to summarize, and to finish exactly at half past, the management of lipids in patients with advanced chronic kidney disease and then say kidney disease remains contentious. In fact, it's more contentious, I think, than I thought, based on the results of the questions we've asked today. I think in the main, KDAGA recommendations from 2013 remain. And there are exciting developments for understanding of lipid disorders in CKD and NSAID kidney disease. There are exciting new drugs coming around, which may be beneficial in renal patients, but they're expensive. And the potential benefit for renal patients will mainly arise, I think, from bigger reductions in LDL cholesterol and reductions in lipoprotein A. We would only be able to use them, I think, in our, in our patients if we get the evidence, and that actually means doing the randomized control trials. And for that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. That was, um, was a really beautiful talk. Both had practical stuff, some controversy, and also some, some new data as well, or you know, new areas of therapy. So thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to uh, ask our delegates um, to, because I forgot to tell you at the start, please uh, submit any questions through the Q&A. We've got a couple, or we've certainly got... Uh, one great question come through. So I'd encourage you um, to um, submit through the Q&A and I'll maybe go first of all with one of the delegate questions because I think it's a good one that goes right to the start and then we can open up the discussion as more questions come through. So I don't know if Charlie you can see, I'm going to read out this question. Um, so I, I think it's a great one to start with and it's actually why we didn't get the straight answer is some of the answers are so controversial. So if there is so much evidence about LDL lowering in the general population, then why do we not see a kind of generalized direct, a directive from governments, public health agencies, et cetera, just to let loose and really say that you get to a certain age or just widespread use of statins, I don't know, age 40, age 50, pick a number. Because um, that's not really come through despite all the evidence from the LD, from the cholesterol trialists, treatment trialists, collaboration studies. What, what, what are your thoughts? Um, I think I'm going to show my age here, but I'm going back in time when before statins were off patent, so they were actually very expensive, considered very expensive drugs. And the arguments we were having in those days is, who were we going to treat? Were you going to cut the level at 50% at cardiovascular risk, or 40%, 30%, 10%, less than 5%? And over the years, the guidelines have really reflected that, they've gone down from 30 to 20 to 10 to now pretty much everybody. Uh, so less than 5% because it, it's a cost effective. The drugs are, are very cheap. Certainly in the UK, I think 40 milligrams of a total statin is two pounds a month or three euros a month. It's not, you know, it's, it's pretty much nothing. Uh, it's less than a, than a cost of coffee or something. Um, the guidelines do reflect that, I think. The guidelines do say anybody over the age of 50 should pretty much be on a statin. Um, I am over 50, I'm not on a statin, and that perhaps answer your, answers your question. Um, yeah. It's, it's probably it's not politically it's expedient to tell the whole population that they should be taking a drug. Um, certainly the guidelines do seem to reflect that, um, and I'm possibly part of the problem because I probably should be taking a statin. I don't know, does the panel have any different views on that? I, I think that uh, one problem is that uh, the healthier is the population, the lowest is the possibility that people want to take a drug if it doesn't feel themselves sick. I mean, blood pressure is, it's not a disease, but it's considered as a disease in as a, from patient or from surgeons, the general population. So even with uh, low compliance, they are set to take the pill because they are afraid of having high, high blood pressure values. For cholesterol is something different. I mean, they just say, well, my cholesterol is a little bit higher. And probably they do not understand the risk involved. And uh, they probably wouldn't take a drug every single day for years for that. I think yeah. this is a difficulty. There, there is a very difference between perception. Um, if you look at the, the publicity about statin side effects, it's huge. Um, every time I prescribe a statin to somebody, they say, are my muscles going to hurt? And you try and argue scientifically with them that actually the proportion in the trials is almost exactly the same between 
those randomized to placebo compared to those randomized to active treatment. In observational studies, it's very different. Those patients take statins, pretty much a large proportion of them do get muscle aches. That is reflected in the popular press and the popular media, disinformation study. Um, so people are, are reluctant to take statins. Um, and I think that's probably why governments don't put statins in the water effectively. Um, that would be my opinion. But the guidelines do reflect that actually pretty much everybody over the age of 50 should be on statin. And probably the same attitude is also reflected somehow. I don't want to skip a, a topic maybe, but uh, in the general practice uh, uh, regarding people with CKD, we have uh, uh, good evidence saying that we need to treat patients with statins, but I'm not so sure that in everyday clinical practice, we prescribe statins or statins plus ezetimabia to right. everybody. I just had another thought. If you remember the early days when the 4S study was published, there was, seemed to be an excess of suicides in those receiving simvastatin. Um, it seemed to be by chance, uh, but it, again, it encouraged people to argue that lowering cholesterol may be dangerous. Um, I think that argument's been discredited, disproven in all the meta-analysis that have been done. The same argument is just being raised now with the PCKS9 inhibitors. I saw that reflected somewhere. Actually, you've got to be careful you don't reduce the LDL cholesterol too low because it will interfere with brain function. I think I don't think that's based on any scientific fact whatsoever, but again, it's being raised in popular media. Okay, should we go to some of the other um, questions that have been offered because there's loads of great questions coming in. Oh, great. Um, so, which is, which is a sign of what a great talk it was. But, um, I'll, I'll just go, um, I'm going to pick one first of all, and I want to jump down to one, but um, what about measuring LDL subtypes in CKD patients? So, I mean, the problem is we can only measure what the labs offer in our different biochemical setups. Uh, yeah, and so certainly in the UK, very few, a lot of labs don't even measure LDL. They use different uh, formulas for calculating, which in the, in the context of high triglycerides don't work. Um, I think there's more to do uh, in terms of refining and heading towards population-based treatment, towards individual personalized medicine type treatment. As I was alluding to with the lipoprotein A versus LDL cholesterol concentration, it could be that a lot of our patients were actually, by giving them statins, when we measure what we think is might be a high LDL, we're actually making things worse by increasing the LPA and not and only decreasing the LDL is possible. And maybe that's one of the explanations I offered as to why statins might not work in dialysis patients. So yeah, I think there's a lot of work to do in this area. And I think as assays and um, get better and more widespread, I think we will be heading more towards personalized targets rather than one size fits all. Okay. Um, I'm going to take one of the questions here, which has come in, and then I, I think we should offer it to all, all of the panel, but Charlie, you can maybe lead off. Um, so you've, what, you've got a patient with prior cardiovascular event, your prior MI, um, CKD, and they've been on high dose statin, let's say a torvastatin 40 or 80, and they then transition from CKD to hemodialysis. Would anyone stop the statin or would we all keep them going? What do you think? Uh, I wouldn't. Um, so I think in my talk, when I had the wheel of doom spinning around, I think I lost a couple of slides, but I, I offered that as that kind of scenario as, a, as, a, as an example. Um, it doesn't make sense to me to stop the statin. Certainly the SHARP trial showed that there seemed to be benefit in those CKD patients that transitioned to dialysis from a statin. And I think that probably reflects the fact that in order to benefit from a statin, you've got to be on it for at least a couple of years probably. And the longer you're on it, the more you benefit. Um, equally, if you're on dialysis and you come in with ST elevation and a massive troponin lies and you have a coronary angiogram that shows diffuse coronary artery disease, um, my cardiology colleagues think I'm crazy by even suggesting that we shouldn't be starting them on a statin. And I only raise that to be provocative uh, because I would start them, I certainly would take a statin if that was my coronary arteries on dialysis. The guidelines don't tend to support that, but I think that's something that we, we probably need to get a better handle on. And again, I'd be interested to see what the panel says because I, I thought that was the only answer in my questions that I got a predictable that I got the answer right, I think, or I predicted what the audience were going to say was that cardiologists, 90 odd percent of them, want to start statins in a dialysis patients, and only 10 percent didn't. Whereas all the other questions I, I predicted wrongly. But over to the rest of the panel. 
Ah, Over here. I suppose that everybody agree with me that um, the present, initial presentation of CKD patients, we measure lipid profile, LDL, HDL, and triglycerides. And then during the course of uh, CKD uh, disease, uh, the patients come to dialysis. And what's uh, your opinion? Uh, how often should we measure lipids uh, during the dialysis treatment? Uh, every year or every half year or, or nothing more? Because according to Kaidigo, Kaidai, Kaidai 2013 um, guidelines, there is no need uh, for follow-up measurements in dialysis mm -hmm. patients. Um, at our apartment, um, at my patients, uh, we measure lipids uh, so every six months, uh, minimum two times, um, minimum one times uh, per per year, uh, and at most patients two times per year. And uh, what's it's, what's your opinion? What's your opinion, Charlie or Paddy? Um, I, I don't measure lipids in, in my patients. <laughs> Um, if I measure them, it's to if, to try and convince the patient to take a statin. Um, my argument for that is if they're a high risk, all the evidence shows they benefit from a statin regardless of what their LDL is. The better, the bigger the reduction, the better the benefit. But it doesn't, the baseline crack, the LDL or the subsequent LDL response um, doesn't interfere with what I change, what I how I manage them. I'll measure it if showing somebody that's got a high LDL might make a difference, or possibly now with these new drugs coming in, if they haven't had an adequate response, whether I get, I'm allowed to use these drugs by my providers. Mm -hmm. Again, that, that might be a, possibly an extreme version of what other people do, but I'd be interested to hear. In our center, we measure uh, lipids once a year, but uh, I think that uh, they do not change the attitude of treating the patient, whether or not they start it. It gives you more an idea of uh, the nutritional status of the patient. And then I agree that the decision of uh, keeping the starting if uh, coming from before the start of dialysis or start a new, starting uh, a new patient with starting goes somehow uh, beyond uh, the simply the cholesterol level. Uh, low cholesterol could be a mirror of uh, malnutrition also. All well, we know that so I mean it's uh, yeah. important uh, to to measure <laughs> so routinely not not to to stop the the measure the lipids at dialysis patients. Yeah, my, my only additional comment is is in some patients and I think it's only in some patients where you have such a vast degree of polypharmacy towards the end of life or towards the you know more frail phenotype where. You may wish to count up the medication. It is a, just, you, there may be some patients where it may be appropriate, but that to stop statins. But in da, established on dialysis, no prior cardiac events, and becoming frail. I think there's a re, you, some people you can't make that argument to continue, but that's, yeah. that's unusual. But I think I think that's why we've got such a spread of answers to that question. Is there's there's no no answer. I think that reflects the lack of evidence, doesn't it? Because um, I think there's strong evidence one way or another. Although I said that I thought I. <laughs> That was what I said about LDL cholesterol in the general population. But I think certainly in dialysis patients, the, the evidence is, is very weak. I don't know if you like, Charlie, you've got access to the chat. There's just some, some great questions. You could randomly pick any of them. Um, okay. um, but, you know, obviously lots of them are um, around things that we'd like to measure that we maybe can't measure or don't measure, such as uh, do you measure lipoprotein A in dialysis patients to decide on uh, statins to... I mean, I think you've already answered that one that you don't use levels very often once people under dialysis. I don't. I mean, measuring lipoprotein A, would be, I think, would be fascinating in dialysis patients. Um, I'm not sure, that, as far as I'm aware, there's no real evidence to support lowering it in dialysis patients because nobody's done the study. But certainly, there's, there is an association with risk. Um, even in, again, in the general population, targeting LPA, again, has not been. Is not that evidence based. Certainly, a lot of evidence that LPA changes risk stratification, so you can move people up and down on the risk based on basically genetically predispositioned LPA concentrations. But I'm not sure about um, dialysis patients. And to be honest, it's a bit like the CKD MB, MBD. Uh, there's lots of things you can measure, 
And actually, we don't know what we're doing with the basic ones. We don't know what we're doing with LDL cholesterol. I, I, um, I shudder to think what I'm going to do with even more numbers that I don't know what to do with. Um, sorry, I, I, I don't think I've got answers. Well, it's not, sorry, it's not the, the chat. It's, it's, it's the Q&A section rather than the chat. Um, so I can certainly yeah. see them. Um, okay. So uh, another one that's come in the QA, which, uh, which comes up a lot in the clinic, is um, I think it's a discussion on lifestyle. Where, would you, where do you see uh, the role of exercise or increasing physical activity versus a statin or lipid lowering in general, both, both simultaneously, wait for one? Which would be the priority? Um, obviously we all yeah, I've never seen a study which says exercise is, is bad for you. Um, well, within reason. I think um, taking up rugby playing or skiing for a dialysis patient might be quite a high risk activity that I wouldn't recommend. But certainly, most of our patients are inactive. Uh, most of our patients are frail or are getting frailer. Most of our patients are malnourished. Most of our pa patients suffer from um, sarcopenia. Even if the evidence isn't there, and I know a lot of uh, groups are working on getting the evidence, I think they should all be encouraged to exercise. I don't think that takes away from pharmacological treatment. I don't think it's either or. Um, I think it should be a multiple, multiple, multifaceted approach, like most things. I'm going to take that as very insensitive, Charlie, that you don't remember when I broke my leg falling off my bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was off work for three months and had a, have a large pin in my leg. So uh, there, there are some, some scenarios where exercise is bad for yeah. people, um, but, but that's a slight aside. But you're back to cycling and back to running. Oh, yeah, yeah, all that. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, anyway, that was, that was just a little, like little aside. Get, get to 90 by, rather than not. Yeah. So, so um, you, you obviously highlighted uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the P, P, PC... The PCSK9 inhibitors. I mean, do you actually see these having a clinical role? I mean, you sort of highlighted some of the stuff, uh, you know, some of the existing data from fairly large studies. Are you using them in clinical practice, specifically in CKD, or referring people on to lipidologists for them? Or how, where, where are you placing them in your practice right now? Most of them tend to be initiated by cardiologists in my practice. Um, so it's usually people who've come through the their cath lab, their, their angiography laboratory uh, was severe. And they have high LDL cholesterol, so persistently high LDL cholesterol, or are unable to tolerate a statin. Uh, and the cardiologist will initiate them. Um, I've never stopped them. Um, I keep going. Um, but so far, I'm not, I don't regularly initiate them or, or look into it. Um, they are still very expensive medication. And they're still very restricted in the UK and who we can use them on. But the restrictions are getting easier. Yeah, as the cost confess, starts to come down. I confess I have no experience with them. I wonder, is there, is there any drug interactions that we should be aware of? Are you Not with the PCS9. They're basically a monoclonal antibody that right. targets what it says on the, on, on the tin, doesn't, doesn't interfere. And that's one, one of the um, selling points, I think, because potentially in transplant patients, there is absolutely no interaction. Uh, and I've deliberately stayed clear of, of transplant patients. That's probably another subject in itself. But they're fairly, um, they're fairly limited in their interactions. In fact, I don't know of any. Most of the side effects are related to the injection site, as you would expect with any injected medication. But again, the, the effects are minor. There's, there's always been some concerns about immunogenicity. So if you're using antibodies, that you'll develop antibodies to the antibody. Um, but so far, I think the reports have been very, very small or very minor. I, I read that, that uh, at least in the United States, costs are uh, coming down a little bit. So maybe the hope that yeah. it will be more uh, affordable for the patient in everyday clinical practice. And maybe the cost will come down low enough so we can do a trial in our dialysis patients. Yeah. <laughs> but probably new drugs could be, would give us much better results than studies in dialysis patients. So the hope so is the theory is that. Theoretically, yeah. it, it's possible and definitely needs to be tested. I don't think we'll get a pharma company to, to pay for it. It'll have to be um, either charity funding or government funding to do that study. If, 
if I can add, I'm, I'm quite puzzled from the fact that uh, CKD patients are, are, are left outside from the, the experimentation, the clinical development of all these new agents, starting from the, the idea that uh, the probably they are, the subpopulation will benefit more of these new drugs. So I cannot yeah. understand why. A lot of these things are made for economic reasons rather than scientific reasons. Yeah. Other than, I suspect that's... Whenever a pharmacological company decides a trial, they try and stack the odds so that they'll be successful. CKD patients often mm. skew the result. Um, I was looking at, um, before in preparation for this talk, I was looking at the last two um, omega oil fatty acid studies, for example, um, reduce it and strength. I can never get them which way around they are, but reduce it actually was a positive study. It worked strength. Uh, didn't, so it had to be terminated early because of lack of function. Lots of people arguing why that might be. One of the things that hit me was that strength included patients with GFRs below 30 and on dialysis. I haven't seen a sub-analysis. I, I presume a trialist would choke at the doing a sub-analysis of a prematurely terminated study, but it'd be fascinating to see if that was what may have been what skewed the, the result or part of it. There is a question from Dr. Sher, Stefan Sher. Do you recommend to measure LPA in dialysis patients to decide whether or not the patients might need a statin? Uh, <laughs> not easy question, uh, but... Well, uh, statin increases LPA levels, well, LP little a levels, so... Yes. It would be another reason not to use a statin on them. Um, it might be a good reason to use a PCKS9 inhibitor, for example, or... An, or in clisseran if, if we're allowed to use it. But no, given that I can't treat it at the moment, I wouldn't. Can I reel back a little bit to Sharp? And, uh, you know, so, so you, you I, I don't know if you covered any great detail, but um, Sharp obviously contained azetamibe as well as simvastatin. Mm. Um, and I don't think you covered azetamibe. And I just wondered if you think it's got any role any, 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 anymore, uh, given other data with, with, with that agent. Mm. I think basically the data from statins is, is very easy to focus on them as a pharmacological entity, but I think what we should be focusing is on LDL reduction and lipoprotein A reduction. And I think what acetamide does is it lowers LDL even more in combination with the statin. Um, again, I think the, the reports of into statin intolerance in CKD and dialysis patients is probably overstated. Um, again, maybe that should be one of the questions I, I put out there. Um, but it, it certainly does allow you to reduce cholesterol even more. So it's not surprising that it has the, uh, the effect. Um, I tend not to use acetamide too much in my dialysis patients. Um, I tend to focus on a statin because persuading them to take a statin is hard enough. Um, but certainly, um, yeah, I've got no problems with acetamide. I will use it a second line if um, the cholesterol reduction isn't good enough in, in my CKD population. Can I, can I say, I could, I could talk about, um, one of the things you didn't cover, and I have my own views on it, but do you think that, that statins or lipid lowering has any effect, positive or negative, on CKD progression? Um, my reading of the literature is that it probably doesn't. Um, I know a lot of people read the literature differently and say it does. Um, I don't think it, it matters that much. If there is an effect, it's small. Uh, and so it's not, wouldn't be the reason to use a statin. I would use statin to keep my patients alive rather than to prevent them progressing. But again, I'm happy to be challenged in that. Yeah, I'm interested what you guys think. Uh, Lucia, do you, do you have, think, have any view on that? Because it comes up time and time again. Sorry, the microphone was, was shut down. Uh, I do agree with, uh, that the effort is mild, and uh, especially now that uh, we have uh, new drugs, SPLT2 inhibitors, I mean, uh, studies are not the reason uh, to be given just for uh, slow down CKD progression. For sure, to reduce the card cardiovascular risk is the main object, definitely. Sure. Also, because uh, positive results were mainly from meta analysis, so I, but from observational studies, so there were all indirect evidences. 
Yeah, no, I, I tend to agree with that, but I, I think it does come up as a kind of dogma. Oh, you know, if there's atheroma in the kidney, it might be a good thing. But no, I, I it might be. And, and I think and my, my other thing I'm slightly worried about is the because of all the excitement with SGLT2 inhibition that we're going to lose the fact that these trials have been done, such as, you know, going back 4S, WASP drops, which we're proud of in the west of Scotland. And, you know, more recently, Sharp, for example, that suddenly we just think, oh, get everyone an SGLT2 and forget the, the old drugs which have some role in, 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 in cardiovascular risk. Do you think that's a risk? People like new things. People like new things. They like spending money. Um, these new drugs are not cheap as well. I said, I don't know how much they cost, but certainly they'll, they'll be a lot more than two pounds a month or three euros a month. Um, I think that there are still room for other new drugs, also because we are far away of uh, every result or our all our problem with just with SGLT2 inhibitors. So there's still a lack of uh, new drugs and better treatment for our patients. They are, I mean, they are improving the care, but they are not the definitive solution. It'd be ironic if we prevent people progressing towards end-stage kidney disease, but allow them to start dying from heart attacks yeah. on the way. You know, hopefully that will not happen. Sure. Um, I, I got to, because I, because we're running for time, and I think we need to do a couple of housekeeping announcements at the end. Um, for the patient with CKD who's first referred to the clinic, do you, you know, if somebody has stable CKD, 3B, referral from primary care, do you, and you do feel you don't need to see them, you know, their kidney failure risk equation is low or whatever, you know, whatever, do you still write to the primary care and say, please make sure they're on a statin? You know, how proactive are you in these patients? Start, start with you, Charlie, and then I'll, I'll ask Robert. For do you want the, um, the idealized answer or do you want the truth? <laughs> Uh, let's go for the ideal. We're, we're doing, we're training, we're training, we're, we're, we're yes, trying to. Uh, yes, best I always still. tell the patients and anybody who's CKD 3B, age over 50 or, or high risk to start on a statin. The truth is I often forget. Yeah, probably, probably me too. It's important, but um, yeah. Robert, what do, you, what do you do in your practice where you, where you get referred these fairly stable CKD patients? Do you push lipid lowering with statins? I'm not so pushy. I mean, uh, I'm sorry about it, but it's not that I don't believe uh, in statins because I do believe in statins, but rather because uh, in uh, clinical practice, you have so many pills to take care that uh, sometimes uh, wrongly, you have to prioritize. Uh, and in the end, uh, if it's not that you cut them, but you don't start it because you just see the long list uh, and uh, you say, well, let's see, let's wait. I, I understand it's a mistake, but uh, sometimes yeah. when you find there, sometimes you do it. It's what I think we're seeing the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to cut because I think we should round up and thank Charlie for an absolutely fantastic uh, overview of this area. Um, it's really, really enjoyable. And, and thank my. Um, my uh, co-panelists for uh, for encouraging I felt sort of farce, a fireside chat over coffee like being at a conference uh, which was great um, I, I also just like to highlight that these uh, these e-seminars I think they're a fantastic initiative for keeping education uh, going and allowing us to uh, keep going there is another one coming up on the 8th of March hosted by the immunology immunonephrology uh, working group it's on uh, management of membranous nephropathy so I certainly look forward to that because I think it's, um, again, there's been lots of developments in that area. And by participating live, uh, participants do get one, uh, one European uh, credit for continuous medic, uh, medical education, which is an exclusive benefit for ERA members. So I hope this is beneficial, not just for your actual education, but it's also recognized in one's portfolio for uh, keeping up to date. Uh, I know I have to actually do my equivalent of filling in my forms for one of my colleagues to appraise me within the next couple of weeks. So thank you very much for for um, to Charlie and my co-panelists. I think it's been and clearly thanks to the ERA team for putting on such a fantastic, well well organised seminar. Um, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs>